Well, hello, everybody. I hope you are doing well this Friday afternoon. Um, thanks for the opportunity to visit with you today on common insects, pe insect pests of fruit trees. Um, so we'll get started here. What I'd like to cover uh, would include the insects themselves and some of their biology and obviously the pest host relationship. We'll also um, discuss beneficial insects, some sampling techniques and sampling tools, uh, management of pests and, and other things as they may uh, develop. So the first insect that I would like to talk about would be the um, group of insects known as aphids. Some people call them plant lice. Um, so this is an image of what that insect looks like. And with respect to their biology, they have a simple metamorphosis, um, egg, nymph, and adult. They typically are a pear-shaped insect with a piercing mouth part. And um, one of the characteristics that aphids have are structure, structures called cornicles, and we'll show another image of those. And uh, one of the telltale signs of aphid infestation on, on any plant is that of the production of honeydew. Um, there are both winged and wingless forms of this animal, and they overwinter as eggs on uh, the, the host plant. Uh, they are asexual. They, they, they reproduce by producing live young, um, and there is no need for fertilization for this animal to produce eggs. And they do have a high biotic potential because each um, aphid has the potential to produce um, many, many individuals. So again, this image shows kind of the pear-shaped body. We see on the end, the, the distal end of the animal, these uh, structures, these are cornicles. Um, they aid in defense mechanisms and not in the sense of physically harming uh, a predator, but they uh, emit uh, different uh, biochemicals. Um, right here on the front end, we have uh, this piercing mouth part that's actually embedded into this leaf. Um, and then these are the, this is a, an immature uh, aphid. Specifically, I want to talk about green peach aphids because that seems to be a, a hot topic, at least in my community. Uh, green peach aphid has a, a multitude of different hosts, uh, prunus species uh, on trees, um, peaches, obviously, but they're also um, tend to develop on weeds and thus the need for good sanitation um, wherever you have your um, tree plantation. So right here we have um, some close-ups of green peach aphids. Uh, this is my fat thumb right here, and I've opened or tried to open the curled effects of the feeding damage of the green peach aphid. And I have another slide right here that shows just, you know, dozens and dozens of this animal that have colonized the underside of the leaf um, at early season. So I think this, I took about a month, maybe six weeks ago. Um, this actually, this tree belongs to me. Um, and notice how the leaves are curling. Um, so the reason the aphids colonize the bottom side of the leaf is that's where the phloem um, uh, vessels are, the, the veins of the, of, the tr of the leaf. And that's what the insect is targeting to um, draw from uh, as a food source. And if we fast forward six weeks from that point, then um, one of the first things that I get phone calls about this time is, hey, my peach tree is dying, the leaves are dying. And so this is the net result of just the trauma that the feeding of aphids has on those early leaves. Uh, oftentimes the tree will um, refoliate, but uh, obviously this is just not conducive for carbohydrate production um, for the tree to um, uh, nourish itself, send carb carbohydrates to the fruit, et cetera. Another type of aphid that is very common um, are called woolly apple aphids. And you see on this slide right here, uh, it almost looks like a cottony fungal type of growth, but it's not. It's actually 
the protective covering of wax that this animal produces. Um, this is an interesting animal in that it feeds on uh, the roots as well as the uh, above ground portion of, of the tree. Um, this animal overwinters actually on roots and or on bark fissures of the host tree. And unlike um, our friend, the green peach aphid, this animal has reduced cornicles where they're very difficult to observe. And um, one of the uh, results of its feeding damage is that they do form galls on the roots and stems of, of the uh, tree. So right here, we have a close up of uh, colonies of uh, woolly apple aphids. Notice just a cluster of uh, waxy material. And so right here, if you're just looking at this growth, you wouldn't think that there's an animal living under there. And also, um, incidentally, this tree I've been observing for many, many years. And prior to uh, me observing it, my colleagues have said that, yeah, this, these trees have always had woolly apple aphids and they do form uh, growths or galls on the host plant. And right here, we see that uh, this is a root of uh, a nearby specimen of that tree that I just showed. And this is uh, showing the gall formation of uh, the results of woolly apple aphid damage, which um, naturally there's so much trauma here that uh, the root is unable to uh, uptake water and nutrients. And ultimately the tree begins to decline. Uh, another interesting feature of this animal is that they have a tendency to colonize pruning wounds. Um, this is a horrible example of a pruning cut, but nonetheless, you see that right in here, there are some woolly apple aphid colonies in this um, uh, severed branch that actually had uh, the bark peeled away. And then uh, one of the things that I notice on uh, the leaves is that, and, and this photo was actually taken last week, uh, but this telltale sign of the decline of new leaves as a result of the feeding near that, um, that leaf bud. So this is not a late fall picture. This is just last week. And then right in here, it's a little um, off focus, but right here we have the bully apple aphid colony uh, feeding on the stem near the leaf buds. Uh, one interesting thing um, with respect to ecology is the symbiotic relationship between ants and aphids. And so these are field ants. Um, and if you've ever seen a colony of aphids on any a plant in your garden, you may see these uh, ants being uh, very protective of their food source. They, they're actually, they don't eat the aphids, they eat the byproduct of, of honeydew. And uh, again, this was taken just a few days ago. And uh, these field ants were just uh, on guard, ready to uh, protect their colony of, of aphids uh, in the event of a, uh, an invader, a predator, or myself. I actually teased them with a pencil and they immediately uh, took a defensive stance. So right here, this um, image, I, I brought, I, I collected some of the woolly apple aphid colonies and teased out some of the cottony material and exposed all these little dark circles right here or um, oval shaped things are actually the woolly apple aphid immatures uh, nymphs. And then here's an older instar nymph that you can actually see the legs right here. So underneath that uh, mass of wax is, is actually the animal. They typically are a darker color, uh, almost purple. If you squish them, um, they, they'll stain your fingers like a purple color. Um, another interesting thing about uh, aphids is that whenever the host um, is stressed uh, beyond the point of uh, it providing nutrients to the aphids, they actually uh, begin to change forms and develop wings. So these are winged forms or alates. Uh, this particular uh, uh, slide is uh, from apricots and uh, this is a mealy plum aphid. And uh, again, the, the curling of the leaf is a telltale sign of uh, aphid damage. Another interesting thing about aphids is that they have, uh, again, just the uh, potential to, oops, the potential to um, uh, reproduce in, in, in huge numbers in a short period of time, especially when the temperatures are cooler. Now that um, temperatures are warming, um, I'm seeing more and more uh, of the decline of, of aphids. 
um, not in a, a, as well as the uh, impact of some predation, primarily lady beetles. So whenever we talk about you know managing or control practices, um, uh, we need to just call to mind the um, practicing of good integrated pest management strategies when it comes to control measures. Obviously, the foundation is that of prevention, keeping the host trees um, in in good health, making sure they're they're, they're proper, properly uh, irrigated now this time of the year, uh, especially after prolonged drought. Um, uh, I, I see a bunch of uh, trees in decline simply because of drought stress. Uh, cultural and sanitation practices are important, keeping uh, trees and their environment uh, free of uh, possible um, debris uh, that can harbor pests. And then using physical or mechanical controls, biological controls, and lastly, using uh, least toxic uh, chemical control. So um, with respect to aphid, aphid management, it's very important to start the process early, scout, sample the trees prior to the onset of the uh, visual damage that you might see of curling leaves. Um, and you might wanna target trees that actually have a history of aphid infestation. Um, you wanna select um, uh, any sort of uh, chemical intervention that is, that is softer on uh, beneficial. So you wanna preserve uh, any natural enemies, lady beetles, parasitoids, uh, lace wings, et cetera. Uh, oftentimes people say, well, can't we just, you know, go to the um, greenhouse, uh, whoever's selling beneficial insects and release them, especially lady beetles. And lady beetles have a tendency to, uh, to have a very strong dispersal um, uh, gene. And, and when they are placed in, a, in an unfamiliar area, because you're buying them as, as adults, they have a tendency to migrate. So maybe if your neighbor buys lady beetles, they'll migrate on to your place and vice versa. But um, uh, some of the literature suggests that if you're going to do releases that you might want to do it at night and uh, preferably when the temperatures are cooler, give the insects an opportunity to kind of settle in. Um, so some standard practices that might help with um, aphid management is using just high pressure water, especially on the early in onset of aphid infestations. Um, insecticidal soaps and neem oils are also um, a good selection of, of chemical control because they actually just impede the uh, insect by uh, plugging their spiracles. And uh, they do, neem oil does have insecticidal, a broad spectrum insecticidal activity. Uh, but again, you have to do this uh, typically before there's a large population of, uh, of aphids. And then pay attention to uh, ant management. So um, right here, this last little point, telescoping generations. Um, I'm just gonna go ahead and go back to the slide of um, the aphid real quick. And um, so this is a female, um, stem mother is another name that one might call the adult uh, female aphid. So they give birth to live young. Uh, obviously here, this is um, uh, a newly um, uh, birthed, nymph of the aphid. And so inside her body, we have, we have the immature aphid. And if one were to dissect um, this animal uh, cross-section, you would find this uh, you know, young inside her. And inside this aphid is another uh, developing aphid. So hence the name telescoping generations. And that really leads to the biotic potential of aphids to develop large populations in a very short period of time. So we'll get back to um, where we left off. Okay, ant management. Again, um, uh, I was looking at uh, some conifers the other day and uh, Sinara aphids, a very giant uh, conifer aphid, uh, had again been tended by field ants and they, they're very uh, good at keeping predators away from feeding on uh, the aphid colonies. And so one way to manage uh, ants from actually getting onto the tree, if there's aphids, obviously we don't grow citrus here in New Mexico. This, I borrowed this slide, um, but is to use a band of tanglefoot. It's a sticky material to prevent the ants from crawling up and actually tending to the aphids up here. Um, you want to make sure if you do this practice, not to put any of the uh, 
uh, that product directly on the bark of the tree. Okay, uh, codling moth, the proverbial apple in the, uh, you know, in, in the, the proverbial worm in the apple is, is this animal right here, Cydia pomonella. Um, very, very um, destructive pest of, of apples, of the fruit itself. Uh, notice that this larvae is, uh, it's almost full grown, probably getting ready to uh, drop to the ground, find a safe place to pupate, but they're kind of pinkish in color. And this animal primarily is, um, they, they don't feed on the pulp, but they actually target the seeds of, of the apple fruit. Um, does have a complete metamorphosis, um, egg, larva, pupae, and adult. And the, um, uh, th this has a very interesting biology in that they overwinter as a mature larvae inside a protected area. And then they pupate later on in the spring um, and then emerge at, here in Santa Fe. I've been monitoring them somewhat uh, for the last three years. Um, and so about the first uh, week of May is when I start trapping adult males in some pheromone traps. Um, the adults are uh, grayish brown moth, um, kind of nondescript other than they have some striations on their body. We'll take a look at some here in a little bit. The eggs are very tiny, very difficult to uh, locate, but they are laid uh, singly by the female on or near the fruit. And then when the egg hatches, the larvae begins to feed on the fruit itself uh, in search of seeds. So right here is an image of the male, uh, probably, a well, I'm not going to say this is the adult of the coddling moth. And notice these um, striations on the uh, wings of the, of the coddling moth. So this is how you would see them at rest. And then at the distal end, there's some fringes, but also kind of neat. The light has to be just right, uh, almost like a metallic copper sh uh, brass sheen on the end right here. Very distinctive of this animal. Um, the egg right here is very, very tiny again, uh, very small and very difficult to locate. Um, and uh, they do, um, the females do lay about 70 eggs. Uh, and they're not laid in clusters, but they're laid uh, singly as the female visits um, uh, egg laying sites on the tree. Again, as I mentioned earlier, um, using pheromone traps to monitor um, uh, coddling moth populations. Um, Basically, I use a delta trap um, and I deploy them prior to uh, bud break. Uh, they're baited with a pheromone, a sex pheromone, and I only catch males in this, in this trap. And they need to be placed about six to seven feet up into the canopy of the, of the tree. And again, notice that there's, uh, the buds are starting to swell, but uh, it's very, very early in the season. And I choose to do that simply because I don't want to miss um, any uh, of the early season emergence of, of this animal. And then uh, there does take some effort because you got to monitor the pheromone traps um, relatively frequently. And it's important that if you're going to use this uh, technique, technology to monitor for coddling moths, that you record the first capture um, because that's going to um, play into when the next uh, biological event, egg laying, is going to take place. And again, I mentioned, um, if you're, if you're gonna use that, obviously it's too late to set out traps this year, but uh, this stage of uh, bloom is too late here on, on this section of the slide, but right here, like maybe at the pink stage when the bud, flower buds are starting to swell would be adequate. Again, I choose to place these uh, traps um, a little bit earlier uh, simply because I don't want to have any skewed information when I do monitor for coddling moth. And um, this is showing the bottom of that delta trap. This, it has a, a, a glue-like substance to catch the insects. This um, uh, rubber septum right here is impregnated with the sex pheromone of female coddling moths. And so these are all male coddling moths. And again, you can see the striations on their wings and then very... If you look very closely, you might see that copper metal metallic looking color on the end of uh, the, the coddling moth wings right there. Obviously this, uh, we had a dust storm, so my trap got dirty. So it's, it's been replaced. These pheromone lures can be saved uh, so you don't have to replace them too frequently. And then once the phenology of the tree starts to develop, 
Um, and once you're catching uh, pherom um, in, in your pheromone trap adult males, it's important to start looking for eggs uh, on or near the fruit. Uh, the, I've found eggs on uh, the stem of uh, uh, leaves, but uh, I would focus on looking at fruit as well. Uh, but again, it's, it's, it's a time consuming task and you can get easily frustrated because the eggs are very, very small and, but, but you can see them. Um, a little bit of, I just want to touch a little bit on um, the um, ability to monitor coddling moth using uh, degree days, basically degree days, um, insects being um, uh, cold blooded animals. They're Biology is driven by the accumulation of, of heat units, which is a fancy word of saying that there's, uh, you know, the, using the average daily high, the average daily low, and dividing it by two, and you, you whatever the baseline information is, in case of coddling moth, it's 50 degrees, and you start accumulating um, heat units, um, and certain events take place, for example, uh, or degree days right here at um, uh, between 50 and 75 uh, degree days, um, we would ha have uh, a, a biological event taking place uh, such as egg lay. Uh, so I've been speaking with some friends um, at the Santa Fe County Extension Office that possibly we might wanna expand uh, you know, some of the things that I'm working with is along with some of the things they're working on and actually come up with some viable information and data that uh, homeowners can use to pinpoint uh, biological events that might help with um, managing this insect pest. Because obviously, um, if one is not aware of the, of the insect, it's the, the moths are cryptic, they, they fly at night, you don't know they're there, and then all of a sudden you start seeing fruit drop and then a second generation um, is really the, the worst generation to have on the fruit that is developing, and uh, then you end up with uh, wormy apples. So with respect to coddling moth management, sanitation is very important. Um, if, if you have just one tree, it's not a big deal to you know, pick up uh, fallen fruit that may have been um, uh, infested by uh, a coddling moth. Um, so it's easy, it's very important to pick up uh, and, and, and toss away uh, any fruit that's been uh, infested. Uh, there is in the literature talk of mechanical control using trunk banding, like with uh, cardboard boxes that uh, or cardboard material wrapped around the trunk of the tree. And what that allows for is as, as the larvae um, are, um, are moving up and down the the, the tree, you would provide them with harborage and then you take that material and, and toss it away. Um, I've never tried it, but I, I, I've, uh, I've read literature that it's a viable option on, um, on trees. Obviously, if you have one tree, it might be possible. If you have multiple trees, it might take more effort. Uh, naturally occurring biological control does uh, exist, especially with parasitoids. Um, members of uh, the uh, hymenopteran order of insects. And then uh, chemical control is important. Um, timing is, is, is very important because once the um, uh, little larvae enters into the apple, then uh, there's, there's not um, the opportunity for that insect to be controlled. And uh, especially using some of the biorational pesticides, neem, uh, BT, some of the oils, um, there's a short window of opportunity that has to coincide uh, before, uh, right around egg laying and prior to egg hatch so that you're killing, uh, controlling the small larvae. And as with any insecticide, you wanna make sure to follow the product label um, as, uh, as described. The next insect or series of insects are defoliators, especially early season defoliators. Um, caterpillars. Um, here in Santa Fe, I've seen a lot of uh, activity of this animal, Western tent caterpillar, um, on many different broadleaf trees, including fruit trees. Um, so this is the image of a female that has just laid uh, a mass of eggs on the host tree. And um, they, again, have um, 
many, many different hosts. Uh, most of the folks here, uh, call that the calls that I get are on ornamental trees, but um, this massive, um, uh, the, the silken tent right here is on a cherry tree. Um, there's one generation of uh, this animal per year, and they actually are pretty voracious feeders. So you can see right here, they've defoliated this uh, uh, branch and are moving on to another one. Um, it's important to look for caterpillars at, especially uh, Western tent caterpillar, uh, starting around bud break, because that's when the animal um, is most susceptible, is most likely to um, feed on susceptible foliage. Uh, and again, a spring defoliating insect does much more damage than a fall defoliating insect because uh, the fall in, in the fall, the tree is getting ready for dormancy, but in the spring, it re really needs the opportunity to have leaf um, uh, and canopy to produce carbohydrates. So uh, the larvae of Western tent caterpillar, they produce this uh, silken mass uh, where they stay protected. They, they're gregarious, so they start to feed all together. And uh, for about six weeks, uh, they'll continue to feed. Um, and then once they are uh, in their latter instar, they'll um, become um, independent and wander off looking for places to pupate. And then the adults emerge about July or August around here. And then the females will um, produce an egg mass on the host tree. And the life cycle again will begin next spring. Uh, Telltale uh, characteristics of the caterpillar, um, which is more than likely what you're gonna see uh, are the orange hairs on the ladder in stars. And if you look closely on this slide, you might be able to see a hint of blue on the lateral sides. Um, they do grow up to about two inches um, in length. Uh, and again, you wanna try to find these when they're smaller to control because once they've reached that uh, size, they've already done the damage. So again, if you have a history of Western tent caterpillar, uh, they're probably gonna revisit that same tree next spring. And again, you wanna pay attention to uh, scouting sampling prior to bud break. And then again in September uh, for the egg masses. And um, if you're good at hunting them, you can actually just simply remove the egg mass and um, they'll be, uh, that's one means of, of control. But uh, there's a huge um, benefit to having just the natural predators, parasitoids and pathogens do some of the biological control. Um, simply because you know they're, uh, the, the predators, parasitoids and pathogens do require a food source and Western tent caterpillars would be just that. Um, there's several chemicals that are labeled for um, Western tent caterpillar, but I found especially on individual trees that it's uh, pretty easy just to remove the individual uh, mass of, of uh, caterpillars when, when they're uh, confined in that um, mass of, of silken material prior to them being too long. And I, I really don't like to recommend pruning um, and removing the, uh, the tents like that because, uh, you know, the, the, they don't feed on stems. They are foliage feeders. So they're just uh, simply removing leaf material. And so you may uh, inadvertently remove more of the plant than actually needs to take place. So I, I prefer just to uh, use gloves and remove the, uh, the mass of um, Western tent caterpillars. This animal, uh, the peach tree borer, my, my daughter actually took this uh, picture a couple of weeks ago and sent it to me. Uh, this is a female uh, peach tree borer. Um, I, she didn't take a picture, but just to this side in the planter bed is actually uh, a dwarf peach tree. And uh, so coincidentally, she just happened to go outside and, and, and take this image, which is pretty lucky because I have yet to find a good image um, uh, personally of a, of a peach tree borer. So this animal, uh, again, it, it belongs to, it's, it's actually a moth. Um, and it does have a complete metamorphosis. So it has four life stages and they have a broad host of, uh, of uh, 
fruit trees, uh, stone fruits that they uh, are able to infest, especially on the lower uh, portion of the trunk. Once the eggs hatch, the larvae burrows into the tree and it's easy to identify that because you'll see gamosis or sap at the base of the tree that has uh, frass and, and young trees are more susceptible than, than older trees um, simply because the wounding potential is greater on a smaller diameter tree. Uh, one control method that um, if it's a, an infestation, just a single uh, wound, you may be able to find a small uh, paper clip or small wire and actually probe into the wound and, and physically destroy the larvae. Uh, and then there are several insecticide uh, options, but there aren't too many uh, homeowner recommendations. I believe um, Carbaryl or Seven does have um, uh, peach tree borer on the label. So this image right here shows, uh, this, is, this is the tree right here, uh, the tree trunk, this is the soil line. And you'll see right in here, the sap or the gamosis that actually has bits of frass uh, as a result of the larvae feeding into um, the cambium layer of, of the tree. And so this is where you'll actually see uh, peach tree borer damage. Uh, and again, you, you may wanna uh, pay close attention, especially on small trees, and try to rid the tree of that pest prior to uh, it continuing to feed. <clears throat> so I, I've taken the liberty to talk a little bit about some of the occasional pests, uh, be they nuisance, and then and then some uh, beneficials. Um, and it may be that we'll say, well, you know, most people uh, would identify and and rightfully so, uh, that wasps are, are beneficial. They do, they, they hunt caterpillars. But uh, this actually is, uh, th this particular animal is a European paper wasp. It's, a, uh, it, it, it's an exotic invasive. It's not uh, native to our, our region. Uh, and a few years ago, uh, I sent off to uh, Dr. Sutherland, who's now retired from uh, NMSU and MDA, uh, and, and she confirmed this as a first find in, in Santa Fe County. Um, and the reason that this is a nuisance is that this particular animal has a tendency to nest in random areas. This actually I removed from my peach tree. Um, and uh, obviously the potential is not for them to cause harm to the tree, but they do sting as they protect their uh, brood. So uh, just be aware that if you're gardening and tending to things, just kind of be aware of uh, this particular animal or other stinging insects, such as the uh, bald-faced hornet. Again, this, uh, I, this is a, a, about the size of a volleyball, um, and I collected this uh, here in, in Santa Fe. Um, and you can see the large uh, adult right here, and they do sting. They're, they're pretty docile for the most part, but when they're disturbed, um, boy, they, they come out, uh, of, out, out of their protective nest uh, uh, to, you know, investigate any potential threat to their brood that's inside uh, the nest. So you just want to be mindful as you're looking at your trees that there may be some uh, potential animals in there that you may or may not want to, uh, uh, to contend with. But again, I want to emphasize that wasps and hornets are uh, beneficial in that they do uh, prey on, on pest species like caterpillars, but this is more of a nuisance setting uh, for us as, as gardeners. Uh, obviously, a pocket gopher is not an insect. And that's what we're talking about today. But um, I, I, I want to share this slide with you because um, uh, I have encountered multiple uh, scenarios where especially young trees are uh, invaded uh, by pocket gophers. So right here on my left, you, I, you can see the mounding uh, activity of pocket gophers. Um, and again, pocket gophers have an important role in ecology. They help uh, turn soil and uh, reintroduce nutrients into the soil. But in this situation of trying to grow fruit trees, uh, the net result is what on uh, is on the right where uh, this tree failed as a result of it not having um, a root system. So again, uh, most uh, susceptible are young trees. Uh, notice that 
almost all the supporting roots have been uh, eaten away uh, by the feeding activity of pocket gophers. Uh, so pocket gophers aren't um, uh, protected um, in the, the, the species that we have here in New Mexico, they're, they're, they're in abundance, they're not uh, uh, protected. And so um, one of the best ways to keep an eye on that is just monitor uh, the activity in your yard. If there's no pocket gophers, great. But once you start seeing mounding near, especially young trees, you may need to take um, a proactive uh, stance. And, and I prefer to use mechanical controls uh, such as traps, underground snap traps to um, control pocket gophers. It's pretty, um, it's pretty amazing how much um, material a single pocket gopher can consume in a short period of time and cause uh, significant damage. So uh, th this pest, um, I actually, uh, it was in 2015, I think, uh, I first encountered this here in Santa Fe. This is an apple leaf. This is a pear leaf. Um, this animal is uh, ash whitefly. Uh, it's, it's an exotic insect from uh, the Mediterranean region, North Africa, and it's made its way all the way into New Mexico. If, it, if you're in Albuquerque, you have it. If you're in Las Cruces, you have it definitely here in Santa Fe. Um, so this uh, insect uh, has a huge range of hosts and um, about in June is when I start seeing the little white fly adults right in here, uh, colonizing leaves. And we'll see them, I'll see them all the way till uh, a killing frost. Uh, so again, on the, on the uh, uh, pear leaf, you can actually see it a little bit better, the uh, kind of a uh, heart-shaped insect right here. And then the smaller structures are actually the nymphal stage of, um, of, of the white fly. This has a simple metamorphosis. It's uh, the egg, the nymph, and the adult um, ash white fly. So this is an ash leaf, but I wanna point out something of, of, of interest right here. Two things actually. Um, so right here on my right, I'm, I have my cursor circling the field ant. And as mentioned earlier, the field ant is benefiting from the honeydew that this particular white fly uh, species produces. They produce large amounts of honeydew that um, uh, the ants uh, forage on. And so you'll see field ants actually uh, tending to and protecting colonies of white flies uh, from potential predators and parasitoids. Now, if you look real close on right here, I'm, I'm going to circle two little dots right here. And those are actually parasitoids um, that I collected and sent um, down to uh, Dr. Sutherland uh, a few years ago. And uh, she confirmed them to be uh, the parasitoid and Carcia interon. And so I'm very excited that uh, we have um, some biological control agents uh, helping to keep this pest in control, at least in my community. So um, I wanna point that out because I've seen that on both uh, apples and pears, the, uh, the parasitoid. So it, uh, it, it, it's, it's very important as, as gardeners, when we talk about preserving natural enemies, um, that some of those uh, natural enemies that we benefit from, you oftentimes can't see, they're so small. Uh, so this is a, a, an image of the size, uh, an enlarged image and shows the size of, of the, uh, of the uh, parasitoid. So very, very tiny. And I'm gonna show you a parasitoid here in a little bit that I actually collected this morning. Um, so some other beneficial insects um, are that, that are very common in, in the garden are uh, lady beetles. And uh, obviously they have a tendency to eat and follow aphid populations, uh, and they do feed on other sedentary insects. They do feed on insect eggs, but um, they kind of are a slow, um, uh, it's a slow process to uh, have lady beetles, especially on aphid populations. Usually the aphids reach a high peak and then you'll start seeing lady beetles um, uh, within a colony of aphids in this example. So um, I took a picture of this um, a seven spotted lady beetle at my peach tree at rest. Um, and 
this is unique in that it's a very um, a large lady beetle with seven spots, hence the name seven spotted lady beetle. It has three on either side and then one black spot um, between where the wings connect at the, pro at the thorax. Um, an arboreal species of lady beetle is the twice stabbed lady beetle. You can see the two red spots, one on either um, of, the, um, of, of the wings. And they're very small, but they, uh, they are effective predators. And then not a very good image, but right here, I did uh, the other day see some uh, lady beetle larvae. And, and this stage of lady beetles is the voracious feeder. So you wanna keep an eye out for uh, lady beetle larvae because those actually uh, consume large quantities of aphids and search out for other um, uh, food items, including uh, insect eggs. I wanna talk a little bit about parasitoids um, again, um, very, very small group of insects that belong to the order of insects known as the hymenopterans, the uh, ants, uh, bees, wasps. And this morning I was, I got pretty excited. I've been monitoring uh, an, a, a tree uh, that has had significant populations of uh, uh, woolly apple aphids. And so this morning I went out and I, st I saw several of these little parasitoids and one stood long enough for me to take an image with my iPhone. It's not very clear, but if you kind of strain your eyes, you can see the little antennae and uh, very, very tiny, about a millimeter in length. I don't know uh, what species it is, but I'll, I'll go ahead and collect some and send them off uh, just for the sake of being uh, keyed out for me. But uh, they are present um, unbeknownst to us most of the time, especially if there's High populations of um, aphids, uh, you'll see a lot of uh, generalist parasitoids. And then uh, there are parasitoids of eggs. There are uh, trichogramma wasps, for example, that actually can be purchased um, from uh, insectaries to be released um, and, and placed out. Uh, typically, they, they rear them on uh, 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 and, and place them on like little cardboard cards. And then they hatch from whatever host they were um, uh, using to rear the uh, wasps. And then we would benefit from that augmentation as they search out um, uh, pests, be they aphids or eggs of, of uh, tree pests. So I was pretty excited about that image right there. Some of the true bugs, uh, true bugs belonging to the order of insect uh, known as Hemiptera. Uh, I think the three most prominent um, bugs that benefit us are big-eyed bugs, uh, damsel bugs, and minute pirate bugs. So as the name suggests, big-eyed bugs or geochorids, their eyes are uh, extend the width of their thorax. And so very distinct biology. They're uh, they're voracious hunters. They do have a piercing uh, sucking mouth part as do, as do all bugs. Um, and the four antennal segments is another way to identify them. There are some seed feeding bugs that resemble uh, big eyed bugs, but the telltale uh, di uh, distinguishing characteristics are the large eyes and the uh, four antennal segments of, of both nymphs and adult uh, big eyed bugs. Uh, damsel bugs have a unique body shape. If, uh, if, you're, if you have a good imagination, you start here at the head and then kind of go down. They almost look like, um, like an ice cream cone shape right there. And they do have a very noticeable curved beak. And again, these are predators. They, they, they hunt and seek out um, prey and they use their proboscis to, um, to stab and um, uh, suck out the fluids of, of any uh, susceptible prey. They do have this large femur on, the, on, the, on their foreleg. And so that's a distinguishing characteristic of damsel bugs. So I would encourage you all to kind of maybe you know, learn some of the simple diagnosing uh, distinguishing characteristics of beneficial insects so that you uh, would be encouraged to find out that there are multiple uh, beneficial 
insects in your, in your garden and in your uh, trees. Now, um, anthocorids or minute pirate bugs, uh, I, I really see a lot of benefit from uh, both the nymphal stages as, the, as well as the adults, because although they're very, very small, they're quite voracious um, on feeding, uh, both on uh, soft-bodied insects, but also uh, they'll search out um, uh, insect eggs. So these would be, again, the true bugs um, in our beneficial series. Um, most of you all are familiar with green lacewings. Here's the adult, very um, delicate net winged leaves and obviously the green body shape. And I'm sure many of you have seen uh, the eggs that are laid on these long stalks. And then the egg is up on the end of the stalk. And that helps um, uh, with the, this animal because they, they're, once they hatch, they're looking for a meal and they're, they're cannibalistic, they'll eat each other. And this is a, a later in star uh, consuming an aphid. They do have these long mandibles that uh, aid in capturing their prey and, and feeding on it as well. You can actually uh, purchase a lacewing uh, larvae uh, and or eggs from commercial insectaries. Uh, I mentioned a few times uh, sampling. So these are some of the sampling tools that I use um, whenever I'm out uh, looking for insects, uh, just doing my daily activities. I, I always carry a few vials in case I need to collect something. I, I have a, a 16X loop. I, I, I also have a 10X, but my eyes are getting old and I need to have a little bit more magnification as well as a hand pruner to help if I need to clip off a, a, a branch or something to, if, if it has a you know, pest on it or something that I want to collect. Um, now the dishes, the, this dish pan is, is a, one of my primary sampling tools because I can collect um, insects in here and, and, and just the background itself uh, helps contrast uh, anything that I'm looking for. Right here, um, this is kind of a little more high tech, if you will, uh, sampling tool. This is an aspirator. Um, simply, you know, uh, you use the uh, surgical tube, um, you suck on that, and then you use this end uh, near a sample that you want to aspirate. There is a little um, mesh of wire here uh, so that you don't inhale whatever you're trying to aspirate. So make sure that you have that in there. Otherwise, you'll be surprised uh, by consuming your specimen. Um, but again, these are just some of the sampling tools that I use um, that help me uh, collect and identify different insects. Um, so that's about uh, enough time for us to maybe have some questions. I know I kind of flew by this a little bit, but, um, and I put this uh, uh, praying mantis in because a lot of people definitely recognize this as a beneficial insect. But uh, when it comes to actually uh, consuming the insects that cause significant damage in our trees, they're a little on the slow end, but they're pretty cool nonetheless. This is actually a female. So I'll take any questions if you have any or comments. Thanks. Thanks so much, Victor. Sure. That is a great picture of that mantis. Yeah, it is. Uh, they're fun to watch when they're hunting as well. They, they are, yes. They're, um... uh, we do have a few questions. Sure. Um, the one goes back to the aphids. Mm -hmm. um, so once the ladybugs have eaten the aphid, will Will the aphids return? The potential for them to return definitely exists, but more so I would think that just the, um, uh, the fact that um, aphids, again, have the ability to produce large numbers, large uh, populations, uh, the, you would more than likely see the lady beetles leave uh, when there's no more food. So that's a better telltale sign than to look for uh, returning aphids. The, the lady beetles will stay there until the food is gone. Okay. Um, let's see, I'm just scrolling through them. Do you have any books you'd recommend to learn more about, about this? Oh yeah. I mean, there, there's, there's lots of really great books. Um, uh, I have several, um, keys, uh, more, more technical keys, but, um, I would recommend something like Borer 
DeLong and Triple Horn, um, uh, uh, any of the guides to Western insects. Um, Dr. Whitney Cranshaw out of um, Colorado State University um, has a really great uh, book on uh, garden insects. Uh, so there, there's, there's many different resources out there. And, and of course, with the uh, advent of uh, digital technology, there's just lots of great um, things uh, that you can carry if you do have a smartphone. Yeah, the Whitney Cranshaw's book is a wonderful resource. I use mm -hmm. it. I use right. it quite a bit myself. Right. I actually uh, have my old uh, keys from, gosh, 1983 uh, that I still use today. They're pretty tattered, but I, I, I like uh, I like paper and and just the feel of a, of a guide. I, yeah, same, I buy the books. I should say too, University of California IPM has some good pest management books as well. Yes, University of California has some great information. Uh, of course, NMSU, um, so right. yeah, any of the land grant um, universities have typically just some great fact sheets on, on uh, many subjects, including uh, insects, IPM, uh, pest management. Mm -hmm. Um, have you had any experience managing grape leaf skeletonizer? Grape leaf skeletonizer. Wow, that brings up uh, memories. Um, <laughs> not of late. Um, uh, my, my responsibilities uh, don't put me in the realm of viticulture, but um, that can be, um, uh, you know, a, a very challenging pest. Um, so I'm, gonna, I'm going to plead ignorance for now, but I do know that there's some great resources out there on uh, managing grape leaf skeletonizer. I do know that you wanna make sure to uh, scout and scout often uh, so that you don't end up uh, with high densities uh, and end up having uh, defoliation uh, early, early on. Mm -hmm. And that's when too, you shouldn't touch the caterpillars. Correct, right? yeah, they, they, they have urticating hairs. Uh, there's several caterpillars that do, you know, and depending on the individual that, you know, uh, allergic reaction with the, the hairs on caterpillars can be pretty significant. Um, and actually, you know, uh, you, you want to be mindful of that. You don't want to inhale those, uh, those hairs. Um, so there's a picture in your deck of shriveled leaves on a peach tree. Right. What caused that? So th that was caused simply by the trauma of, of high densities of the aphids feeding on the um, on 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 the leaves. So remember, these uh, that damage occurs on on the uh, very young, tender leaves, and they just can't support uh, all that uh, that trauma to the leaf, and it it literally desiccates the leaf. And uh, by the time you see that, you know, damage has been done, and the and the aphids actually have um, uh, become adults and have searched for other. Uh, sites or other hosts or other leaves on on the same tree. Okay, so by then it's a little, a little too a little late. late. <laughs> you want to make sure not to. And and again, as as the IPM model will, would uh, recommend, you, you really want to make sure that a pest is present if you want to um, uh, initiate a a control measure. So uh, treating after the fact is, is 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 not good ecology. It's not good economics. Right. Um, someone else has had an issue with their apple trees being infested with bagworms. Uh, they've gone and cut them off, and they, but they return every year. Mm -hmm. Do you have any tips for preventing and managing bag, bagworms? Yeah, well, uh, th that's an interesting insect, especially here in, in at least the northern part of the state. I, I do see uh, bagworms typically on landscape trees. Uh, especially London plane trees. Um, but the, the nice thing about bagworms is that uh, after like the first or second instar, you actually can start seeing the little bags uh, forming. And so their telltale evidence is quite noticeable. So if you have time, uh, I would suggest, you know, going and, and handpicking as uh, many as you can, but being a, uh, a lepidopter, in a, uh, uh, you may be able to, um, uh, have success using a BT product, check the label, but uh, the, it does need to ingest the, um, the leaf and consume the BT um, and, and, and have the endotoxin, um, you know, disrupt its uh, internal um, gut. 
So you might have good success controlling that with VT early in the season. You got, you got to really target those early instars. Okay, so again, timing is critical. Yeah, very, very important. Um, and then I know you talked about peach tree borer mm -hmm. and several several management strategies right. for that. Is there any of those are preferred or better methods? Um, really, you know, sanitation is important. You want to keep uh, leaf litter away, uh, which is kind of counterintuitive, but at least up against the trunk of the of the especially young trees, you want to keep clean. Um, one of the, uh, again, uh, many of the literature resources do recommend um, using um, insecticide applications as a preventative uh, approach. Uh, but again, there's, there's only one generation um, of that animal per year. And so uh, recommendations range from like June to July when uh, the females are actively laying eggs. Uh, and it varies from region to region. So um, you, you want to focus on sanitation. Uh, there are pheromone traps that you can deploy that actually will um, uh, detect the male uh, uh, peach tree borers and use that as an opportunity to help in decision making. Okay. Um, are they targeting stressed trees? Um, I've seen both uh, stressed trees as well as well cared for trees. Um, they're looking for a, you know, the, as a female is searching out uh, over position sites, egg laying sites, um, the, they'll target um, uh, healthy trees. Oh, wow. A little scary. Um, yeah. <laughs> that, that is all the questions that we had in here. So just so that Victor, thank you so much for your time oh, you're today and sharing all of that information with us. Sure. And thank you for, for having me. Yeah, and thank you everyone who's joined us today. And with that, we can um, 